me on tonight. So I am the prevention, training and education team leader for Rape Crisis, which is just an unnecessarily long title to say that I manage the prevention project called the Rosie Project at Glasgow and Clyde Rape Crisis. So we have a team of uh, um, prevention workers who go into schools, uh, colleges, universities and community youth groups, and we educate young people um, around sexual violence prevention, um, consent and the law in Scotland, and just general things that we're going to talk about tonight around why sexual violence happens. Um, so I manage that team and we've also got a team of support workers as well. Um, so I'm going to take you through um, how we talk to young people about consent and in particular sexual consent, but we are, we're going to also talk a wee bit about, you know, what it means in Scotland, what sexual violence means in Scotland and where all this comes from and then hopefully what we can do about it. We obviously want to have some good solution. Um, so we'll go, I'll go through the slides and, and as Leanne says, any questions you've got at the end, we can try and answer. Um, so I will just share with you now. Okay. Okay. So, talking about gender-based violence tonight. So we're we're going to um, talk about um, what that means, what gender-based violence means. Now, as we go through the presentation, I will often talk in terms of. Um, she and her, okay, but because I want you to understand that why it's a crime, why we talk about it in those gendered terms, and that's because overwhelmingly women and girls are the victim victims of sexual violence, and overwhelmingly men and boys are the perpetrators. Now, I don't want you to think that we're not saying that there aren't um, male victims of sexual violence. Of course, there is. However, we're talking about those overwhelming numbers and there's lots of support out there for male victims as well. And we'll talk about that as we go through the presentation. I also want to talk about men and boys as allies um, and active bystanders coming on board to talk about this kind of work. Um, and hopefully that will come through as we go through the presentation. But obviously any questions at the end, I'll be happy to answer them. So why? What is gender-based violence and why do we look at it as a gendered crime? Now, part of that, so this is what the Scottish government deems gender-based violence, all these things around here. So we're going to, we will go on to talk about why, we're going to talk about the criminal justice system, but we are also going to talk about that, the reasons that it happens on the next slide. But this is what we're talking about. If we say someone is a victim of gender-based violence or someone is a perpetrator of gender-based violence, this is what we're talking about. So domestic abuse is probably the one that most people would think of, even sexual assault, rape and, and, rape and attempted rape, but all these other things as well. Childhood sexual abuse falls under it. And harmful traditional practices is like forced marriage, um, FGM, that um, female genital mutilation, anything that's cultural-based that's harmful. To, to anybody, harmful to, to, to any gender, um, and stalking and commercial sexual exploitation. So that's when anybody is, is um, sexually exploited for money. So you, you might think about uh, people who work in prostitution, people who work in um, lap dancing clubs, people who, cam girls, you know, who, who are um, selling sex online. So that's what that means. So this is the Scottish government's umbrella term for all of these things. Um, anybody can be a victim of, of these crimes um, and anybody can be a perpetrator as well. But as I said, and we're going to look at the, we will look at statistics, but overwhelmingly, it works out at about around 85% of vic victims of gender-based violence are female and 15% are male. But the majority of those men, the perpetrator is also male. So we're still looking at it in gender terms. We're still looking at, and, we're, and, and if I look, go to the next slide, then why is that? This is what we talk to young people about, okay? So this isn't just about how, this isn't about how you can prevent yourself from being a victim of sexual violence. This is about how can you prevent, how can we prevent sexual violence from happening? How can we, how can we speak to the perpetrators of sexual violence and talk to them about their behaviours? We don't want to ever go down a victim blaming route um, and say, well, if you didn't go out or you didn't wear that short skirt or you didn't drink all that alcohol, you know, or you didn't leave that 
abusive relationship, then it's your fault. We don't ever want to go down that road. And I'm sure everyone in this webinar will agree that nobody who is a victim of this um, type of crime is responsible for it. But unfortunately, that's not the culture we live in. We live in a culture where still victims of sexual violence are either held wholly or partially responsible for what's happened to them. So why is that? And it's because we live in this rape culture. So when we're talking to young people about um, this, this is more digestible, right? If you say to young people, let's talk about rape and sexual assault, quite rightly, they're like, no thanks. You know, they don't want to. It's obviously quite a serious topic to, to talk about. So when I'm talking to young people, I tend to talk about the culture, the gender socialization, how we are raised as men and women, boys and girls, whatever gender you then become, how we are raised in that society, what messages we get. And unfortunately, we still live in a society where boys are subjected, and I say subjected because without excusing offending behaviour, I think it's really, it's a really concerning culture that boys are still raised in. They're still raised in that culture of misogyny. They're still raised, raised in that culture of what it means to be a man. You have to be strong. You have to be in charge. You have to win. You know, there's lots of different ways that you can... That, that makes you a man, you know, you don't cry because that's weak, you know, all these kind of really toxic, problematic messages that young men get. Now, we're not saying that every young man or boy is going to have that, those beliefs. We're not, we're not saying that at all. What we're saying is, is that if they don't have somebody to counteract those toxic messages that they constantly get, then they may, they may not, but they may adopt that kind of thinking that they're entitled, that that is what makes a man, that's the way I have to be. And as we know, when a lot of young men conform to those toxic ideologies about what makes a real man, they often, you know, their self-esteem goes down, their confidence goes down. And, and as we are very well aware of, the suicide rates in young men are sky high and they've got worse during COVID. And I believe that one of that is because of those toxic messages, those messages of what makes you a real man and what's expected of you. And then on the other hand, you've got young women who are socialised to be passive, to be quiet, to be caregivers, you know, to be meek, to be agreeable. And that affects their confidence and self-esteem. So if you get two people coming together, who have got those messages and don't have anybody to help them navigate those messages, we end up with this rape culture. And we talk about the way to challenge that is from the, the bottom of that pyramid up. So it starts off with what is, I don't like the term, but what a lot of people will call, say, low-level forms of um, that rape culture. So your sexist jokes, your homophobic, transphobic jokes, your problematic language, objectifying people. So it starts off there and we still live in a culture where a lot of young people especially don't like to challenge it. They, they don't want to stand out. We do a lot of bystander training. We will talk about being an active bystander, but we do a lot of bystander training with young people about having the confidence to stand up because we, we live in that culture where most people think if somebody makes a, a sexist joke, for example, and then most people might laugh. If you don't want to laugh, you think you're the minority. You think, well, maybe it's me that's got the problem because everyone else seems to find it funny. But what you'll find is, is that a lot of those people in that group don't find it funny either, but they're laughing along for the same reason. They think if I don't laugh, then people are going to single me out. So they tend to go along and they tend to not challenge that culture. And if we don't challenge that, that low level, then we start going up. We start, you know, um, going into those rigid stereotypes, those stereotypes that boys and girls find it really difficult to, to fit into, or some boys and girls find it really difficult to fit into. And it's very heterosexual gender roles as well you know it's either you're you're a heterosexual female or you're a heterosexual male there's no room in that culture for people who have other who are people in lgbt um, community people in the disabled community people in um, black and minority ethnic communities it's very much about that stereotype of what is acceptable which is usually a straight white 
person, you know, so whether that be male or female. So if we don't start challenging that, then we then move up again. And then we're coming into, it goes from the sexist joke to the transphobic joke, right up to actual harassment, threats and verbal abuse. Then if that's not challenged, we'll go up again to the rape, sexual assault, all the forms of domestic violence, and then obviously to the top, where we get those extreme forms of domestic violence, which are so common right now. Um, and actually become more common during COVID because there's less services available and less ways to, to become to have that kind of space so that's what we're talking about we're talking about challenging that and young people are really keen to do that you know when I do these workshops they, they get on board really quickly sometimes for boys there's a little bit of hesitation because they think we're saying all boys and all men and we're not saying that at all of course we're not um, quite the opposite actually um, most of the, the, the amount of male allies we've got is amazing so once they get that, once they get that we're not saying all men and boys and we're not blaming boys for that culture, it's not their fault, it's the culture that they've, they live in, um, they get on board and they get really excited about, well, how can we change this? So that's where we that's where we kind of start from. We start from where does it come from and what can we do about it? And the reason we do it is because of the numbers that are happening. So on this table, you can see here, so this is the police statistics the most recent police statistics from the previous year and from the, the most recent year. Now, what's really interesting here, so in the 2019-2020 category, you'll see there that there was an increase on the previous year. Up until that COVID year there, rape and sexual assault and attempted rape increased year on year, every single year. It's during that COVID year, it's the first time that the, 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 report is, the reports have fallen. Now, that's not to say that's because there's less rapes happening. What it is, is what I've just said before, is that people are more reluctant to report because all our services shut down. The police were overwhelmed with other, with, with COVID and everything like that. There was a lot of um, men staying at home. They weren't going away to work and things like that. So there wasn't that space to do something about it. So you'll see that there has been a fall in that year, but not. But I wouldn't say that's a fall in what actually happens is a fall in reported crimes. But interestingly, in that third one, other sexual crimes, in particular online crimes, sexual crimes online increased during COVID. And that's because, as we know, during COVID, we just lived online. We all went online. We were doing Zoom quizzes where, you know, People were conducting relationships online because if you were in a relationship and you didn't live together, you weren't allowed to be in the same house or room together. Therefore, all can all that kind of moved online. Young people just lived online. So we can see that, and because of that, there was an increase of 11% on the previous year. So this is why we do this work, because it still happens. You know, you can see that, that the numbers there, you know, that that that, and that's just reported only 10% of rapes are reported to the police, 10%, and look at those numbers. So imagine what it would be if everybody reported what, it, what was been happening to them, that those numbers would be off the scale. And we know that because of, there's lots of anecdotal evidence. So if people don't report to the police, they might report tell us, and they might not want to report to the police. And unless there's any child or adult protection issues, they don't have to. They might report to their GP, they might report to a mental health service, um, lots of different ways that we can find out that information without them reporting to the police. So this is why we do it. It's still a big problem. And 48% of all sexual crimes are happening to someone under the age of 18. That's a frightening statistic. Almost 50% of victims of sexual violence are under the age of 18. And I think a lot of that's got to do with that, that third statistic there, that young people live online and it's more accessible. I always say to young people, and it makes me sound really old, but I always say when I was your age, we didn't have mobile phones, we didn't have tablets, we didn't have Facebook, Snapchat, all of that stuff. So if we were being bullied at school, as soon as we got home, that stopped. But now they're in your home, they can get to you anytime because of all this technology that you've got. So we believe that's why, that's why the numbers are so overwhelming like that. 
So when we think about that, if we think about the criminal justice system in Scotland and we talk to young people about what rape and sexual assault is, and we talk to them more importantly, and what I really want to get across tonight is what is consent? How do we talk to young people about sexual consent? So that's what, we'll, that's what I'm kind of going to go through now. So criminal justice system in Scotland. So definition of rape. Now, this is controversial. So pop your questions in the, the, the Q&A, please, if, you, if you've got something to say. I'm not asking everybody to agree, OK? I like a bit of debate, to be honest. So um, if people don't want to say something about this, it's absolutely fine. Now, this is the definition of rape as set by the Scottish Government and the Crown Office in Scotland, which is, as you can see, forced penetration without consent by a penis to the vagina, anus or mouth. Now, that means you have to have a penis to commit the crime of rape. That's the controversial bit. Usually when I say that, I've got a, a classroom or a, a room full of teenagers that just go off. And it's great. I love it. I love it. It's, I love getting them to talk about it. So... So yeah, so the reason that is now, the Crown Office and, and the Scottish Government were reluctant to change the definition. It did, it slightly changed um, because previous to 2009, it was forced penetration by a penis to the vagina and that was it, which meant that men couldn't say they were raped and all genders couldn't say that they were raped orally. So that was some of the changes because what they wanted to say was is that male or, or females could be victims of this crime. But again, the reason they keep that definition or they kept that definition was to honour the statistics of overwhelmingly girls being the victims and boys being the perpetrators. So that's why that's that's the definition of consent. Now we talk about, we, we, we consent every day. So I say that to young people, every day you consent. If you get asked if you want a drink and you say yes or no, you're consenting. If you get asked by your mates, do you want to go to the cinema and you say yes or no, that's you consenting. But we don't talk to young people about sexual consent. And I think we still live in a taboo culture, you know, where we don't want to talk about sex, um, which has resulted in the numbers that we're seeing right now. So it's important that we talk to them. And it's more important that we talk to our children that, that have a penis. Now, I'm having to say that because obviously there's certain genders there's different genders now. So I can't say boys and men. I've got to say someone who has a penis. So if we talk to our young people who have penis, they're the ones that are held responsible in a, in, a, in a court of law, not the victim. So it's up to the person who has been accused of the crime to prove that the other person consented or they had reasonable belief, reasonable belief the other person consented. It's not up to the victim to say, that, that they didn't. It's got to be the person who's been accused. And what they also changed the law to say was consent to one act does not mean consent to another. So you've got to keep getting that informed consent. And there's lots of ways we can we can get consent. And I do the exercise with young people and say, well, tell me how you know somebody's consenting to sex. You know, tell me what that would look like without them actually verbally saying it. And they come up, they, they kind of start talking about body language and things like that. So you've always got to keep getting that consent. And really importantly, consent can be withdrawn at any time. So if you start consensually having sex with someone and the, for whatever reason, and it doesn't matter what the reason is, you, you want to stop and you indicate that in some way and you don't have to indicate it verbally, the absence of a no does not imply consent. And some way that you indicate that you want to stop and they don't, that then becomes rape. And like I said, the victim can be female or male. So that's the definition. And if you want to chat about it at the end, that's absolutely fine. But that's that's what it is under the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2009. And when you, if you look it up, there's lots more explanations in there as well. There is, so this is where people kind of go, right, okay, right, maybe that makes it feel a wee bit better for me because... There's an addition to that, well, an, an, another law that's called sexual assault by penetration. So that's when you penetrate somebody without their consent with an, an implement or another part of the body, which anybody can be charged with, regardless of what your anatomy is, anybody can be charged, any gender can be charged with that or any anybody, whatever, whatever you've got, you can be charged with that crime. So that kind of appeases people a little bit and the threat is... Rape and sexual assault, a rape, 
is seen as one of the most serious crimes. So there's only three crimes that are charged in the High Court in Glasgow, and that's murder, rape and treason. That's how serious to look at it, and it carries a life sentence, as does this. So this carries a life sentence as well. So it doesn't matter what gender you are, if you use an implement, then you can be charged with this crime. So really important is, is consent. So previous to 2009, there was no definition of consent. It was whatever a defence lawyer wanted it to be so that they got the client off. Um, so they had to say, well, what do we mean by consent? What does that actually mean in Scots law? And it, it might not, it might still be as clear as mud, but it's free agreement. Okay, that's what they say. Free agreement that you are consenting to this sexual act free from any kind of intimidation, threat, force, coercion, anything. You are freely engaging in this act. That's what consent means under the law. And what they've said is it's quite clear when you can't consent under law. And they give, hopefully they give a wee list. So we've got some here and we'll go through them. We won't go through them in detail, um, but we'll go through them. And if there's any at the end that you really want to know about, then just give me a shout in the Q&A and we can answer it. So the one that we always talk about and young people want to talk about is incapacitated because of alcohol and drugs. Now, We've got to be really clear about this. We're, you've, we're not talking about everybody who has a bit of alcohol or who takes a drug can consent. We're not saying that. We're talking about past the point of consent, and that's different for everybody. So some people might need, might only need a glass of wine, and they start to feel you know, quite tipsy, and they might get to that point where they're not really in a frame of mind to consent. Some people might need a bottle, and that's just different people. Um, but it's up to the person who is not incapacitated to make sure that that person's of a fit state to consent. And again, when we talk to young people, what does that look like? And quite quickly, they all come out with or slur in their words. They can't walk properly. They might need help. They're not moving. They're not freely. They're not engaging. They're not participating. So we know when somebody is past the point of consent. So that's what they mean by that. It's a difficult one because it's a, it's a defence lawyer's dream if alcohol or drugs are involved because juries tend to go for tend to lean towards reasonable doubt and unfortunately a not guilty verdict. So it's a, it's a very contentious subject. So nobody can threaten you in any kind of way. Um, that seems, sounds obvious, but they've got that in there just, just to let that and know that. Nobody can unlawfully detain you. Nobody can not let you out of a, a house or a car or whatever it is. Um, if they've deceived you in any way about who they are, um, th then that's that's illegal. That, that comes under that. They can't impersonate anybody else. Um, no one can agree on your behalf. Um, if you're asleep or unconscious, now that sounds pretty common sense, doesn't it? But they've brought that in particularly for people who are maybe in relationships because when I, it's, it's quite frightening actually when I do some workshops with young people, now I'm talking about first years here um, and I'll talk about relationships and, and if, if, you know, the teacher thinks it's okay, we'll talk about consent and, and, and sex and I'll say to them so what does that mean when you marry somebody or you go into a relationship with somebody and they say it means you're consenting to that it means you're consenting to do things they, they automatically think being in a relationship with somebody is, is consent therefore if you're asleep or unconscious or something like that then it doesn't matter you're in a relationship and you've consented other times so that must mean you you'll always consent and it's trying to get across that it doesn't matter if you know somebody for one day or you know somebody for 10 years they still have to get that consent. Um, if someone is coerced, so that's a big one for young people. So coercion is we know, like that's, you know, when someone um, persuades you in a variety of ways to engage in a sexual act when you don't want to. And that might be in relationships where he might go in a bad mood or, you know, or be really hostile towards you if you don't might give you a silent treatment for a few days if you don't. Um, they might say, well, I've got a photograph of you, and if you don't do it, then I'm going to show everybody this photograph. They might say, I'm going to tell everybody anyway, so you may as well. So all that is seen under laws coercion, and it's illegal. So we talk to young people about 
you know, and, and they all they all think, but that's the way it is, you know, that's what it's like. And it's really difficult, it's really like worrying for me as a as a prevention worker when I hear young people say, but that's what it's like for young people now. And talking about taking photographs online, but that's what young people do now, you know, and we're like, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> it shouldn't be just because that's what somebody in our culture has said we sh young people should be doing. And another one there is does not have the capacity to consent. So that is somebody mentally doesn't have the capacity. And that that is um, determined by a court, um, a court appointed psychologist. So if someone raises the issue of this person could not consent because of some kind of disability in some way, then somebody would um, assess that situation. So that's what the definition is and that's what consent is. There is the other, this was added in 2016, the non-consensual sharing of sexual imagery. You might be more familiar with the term, and I don't like the term revenge porn, because it implies that the victim's done something to you for you to have to get revenge over them. But that's what it started out as about a decade ago. Um, so that's when somebody over 18, because you have to be over 18 to share sexual imagery. Somebody over the age, age of 18, maybe in a relationship, consensually sharing photographs with each other. And then when they break up, one or the other then shares those images without that person's consent. So they brought they had to bring in a law in 2016 to, to deal with this. It was such an issue. There was it was happening so much and it was causing so much harm um, that they actually had to bring in a law for it. Um, and it's not just about actually physically sharing the images, threatening to share the image or just holding up your phone and just showing somebody. All of that's illegal now. And it can carry up to five years in prison. Whereas previous to that, previous to 2016, you got slapped on the wrist and a small fine. Now you can get back up to five years in prison and you can end up in the sex offenders register. So they're taking it really seriously because of the mental health impacts as well that come with all these forms of sexual violence. And we will talk about mental health. Just keep an eye on the time. So other sexual offences, and this is a lot of information, I know it is, <laughs> roughly it's been recorded. So that's your main things, your rape, sexual assault, your attempted rape, your sexual assault by penetration, your non-consensual sharing of sexual images, and then we have all these other sexual offences. As I say, just Google Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2009 and there's loads of information there. It's quite accessible as well. So these are all the other things that under Scots law is deemed as, as part of the Sexual Offences Act. Um, so that's where your sexual assault comes in. So that's anything that's not penetration comes under sexual assault. Um, that's like unwanted touching and things like that. And I'm not going to read them all out. You can see them all there. Um, but it's it's they're quite clear about what we mean by that. Now, obviously, this isn't an exhaustive list. There's other things that might come up. But they want to be clear about what we're what we're talking about here, um, and they they want to they want to make sure that all those laws are separate as well, so we can understand the seriousness of them. And again, I'm going to talk about the impact of sexual violence shortly. But that's what we're talking about when we're looking at that. And now, and you might not you don't need to be talking to young people about everything like this. You know, I think the most important things are is understanding the definition and understanding what consent means. I think that's the two things that that, that I find more, most important when I'm talking to young people. And when we look at the sexual harassment um, or the Qualities Act, so all of those things that we've just said there, right? So we're we're, ca we're kind of coming down that pyramid, okay? So when we're up there and we're coming down that pyramid, that 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 pyramid we looked at earlier, and that's when someone is so is subjected to some kind of conduct that's degrading or humiliating. So it might not necessarily it might have a sexual element and it might attack some kind of special characteristic, but it's not deemed as serious as all those other things. And for example, now. So this is where we're at now, right? So flirting, gesturing, making sexual remarks. Now, I have heard lots of comments, and I'm sure you have too, about, oh, you can't, you can't say anything to anybody anymore. You know, you can't even have banter. Might be the case, okay? In, in certain contexts and certain situations, you have got to be careful what you say. But you also, we also don't want to go down that road of you can't even speak to each other. You know, we don't want to go down that road. So... People flirt all the time. People make, you know, kind of remarks to each other, but it's what we say and how we say it. 
You know, we're not back in the 19, you know, 60s when it was okay to make really derogatory marks about a woman's body or even a man's body, you know, or, or, or run your hand down somebody's back or something like that. You know, that oh, it's just it's just harmless flirt. And we just don't live in those times now. But that's not to say we can't have banter and we can't have, you know, a wee bit of flirting and stuff. It just always has to be respectful. Um, and and anybody asking somebody, somebody they don't really know or, or if they're asking it to humiliate them, sexual questions about their life, their, 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 their questions about their sex life, you know, it's, it's not appropriate. And it's not always, again, it's not always appropriate to tell offensive jokes. Keep that to, you know, your mates or something if that's what you want to do and don't let anybody else hear. But just because you think it's funny, all that. Stuff. So this is what we're looking at for that sexual harassment that kind of feeds into some of that sexual undertones um, that maybe aren't covered in the Sexual Offences Act. Um, but what I really want, what, what we're getting on to now is that impact. So the impact, this is my job. So my job is a prevention worker, but I've also had years of being a, a support worker. I've worked at Rape Crisis for 16 years. And I've went through the whole gauntlet of doing outreach support and in, in-house support, Supported the youngest of well, the youngest we support is 13. I've supported 13-year-olds. The oldest I've supported is probably in her 80s. So I've seen the whole thing. I've seen the whole age spectrum. Um, and I've seen the impact that it has. Now we're not seeing everybody who is a victim of sexual violence, um, you know, um, experiences all of this, um, but they will experience some of it. And in my experience of working with young people, especially who are victims of sexual violence, self-harm and suicidal thoughts are right up there. You know, when we're doing a kind of scale of how are you feeling and what's the priority for you, young people who have experienced this, that's what we're talking about. And it's still seen as a joke, sexual violence. It's still used in entertainment. In your computer games and films and music videos, it's still seen as no big deal. That's what a lot of people say. You know, there's still a lot of minimization of sexual violence, but I see the harm. I see the impact of that. And self-harm and suicidal thoughts are always at the top of that table. And that's how serious we, we, it's taken. You know, it's, it, but the World Health Organization recognizes sexual violence as one of the worst forms of trauma a human can experience. Much like somebody coming home from war, somebody who survives a natural disaster, somebody who survives a near fatal car accident, something like that. That's the impact that sexual violence has. And this is what I deal with all the time and my job as a prevention and education worker is to try and not let that impact that young person's education we see constantly young people dropping out of school college university because of what's happened to them because they just can't cope they can't just get their head around anything they can't write essays and sit exams and my job is to try and help them one help them stay in education and also help education institutions to support victims of sexual violence in a much more meaningful way. So that's what we're dealing with. That's the impact. That's what that's how serious we have to look at this. And there's a long, there can be a long-term impact. So it doesn't matter. It can be it can be a reoccurring event or a one-off. It doesn't matter. That level of trauma is there. We, as, 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 as humans, we are not built to deal with trauma of any kind, including sexual violence trauma. Our brains are not um, equipped to deal with it. There's a really good um, YouTube video called Trauma and the Brain. I should have put a link here, but I can send it to Leanne and she can send it to you. Um, and it's only about maybe a 20 minute video and it was made by um, North Lancashire uh, Mental Health Services. And it really really brilliantly in this little kind of animation it explains how trauma affects our brain and it affects our ability to to, to speak uh, to speak about it to uh, how it impacts our lives so I can even send a link for that um, to Leanne and you can have a look at that another time but you know it it can there's lots of different ways that, that survivors will deal with that some might be, have resilience, have really good support, 
and then they, they come through it quite well. And if they've got that support and they've got people that believe them and, tr- and people that they trust, they can come through it. And then we've got people, on the other hand, who don't have those kind of supports and that they can have that long-term impact. So how do we challenge it? And this is what we're doing today. We're on here talking about it today. Obviously, education is a big thing. So we want, as I say, we do these sexual violence prevention workshops in schools, colleges, universities, community youth groups. So education is the main thing. And we are constantly talking to education about how they can get it more into the curriculum and things like that. And we obviously go in as much as we can. I think we do need to change how we socialise our young people. You know, all the messages that we give them from such a young age. And I mean, from right right down to the toys and stuff that we buy young people and why we buy them it. We need to start challenging it from a young age and letting, you know, young people understand that they don't have to fit into a stereotype. We definitely need to um, challenge attitudes and we definitely need to challenge this victim blaming culture. It's, it's what stops people from coming forward. It's why only 10% are reporting it. One, because they think nobody's going to believe them, but also because they think they're going to get blamed for it. We have a terrible legal system. It's not a great legal system for victims of sexual violence. That, that could do a whole, I could do a whole webinar on that. Um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk about it further, but it's something that we do need to challenge. And we need to get down to those low-level forms, those right at the bottom of that pyramid, we need to start, everybody needs to start challenging it and encouraging that support, encouraging that to seek support. Um, and we need to recognise that we're all part of the solution for such a long time. What Rape and sexual assault has been seen as a women and girls problem because they're overwhelmingly the victims. And men who don't perpetrate that kind of violence, which is great because there's lots of them, they think, well, it's not my problem because I'm not that kind of guy. But it is your problem because it's everybody's problem. This impacts everybody. And if men are challenging other men, that's fantastic. You know, there's a really good um, organisation. It's called White Ribbon Scotland. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. But they do loads of great work around gender-based violence. You have the same messages as us, but it's all male workers and volunteers. Really, if you want to look that up, White Ribbon Scotland, it's a really interesting um, organisation. And we've worked in partnership with them quite a few times. And the kind of thing that we're really into just now is the act of bystander. Now, we're not saying that it's anybody's responsibility to physically stop gender-based violence. You know, it's, it's when you're safe to do so, intervene. And you can do that in lots of different ways. You don't need to physically intervene. You can call the police. You can challenge it another way. You can check it, check in on that person you were worried about the next day. You can even challenge the person that you think was doing something they shouldn't have been the next day. There's lots of ways. But we can campaign. We can do lots of things to be an active bystander, but that's where we're going with young people and it's what we really want them to think about. And just to finish up the last couple of slides, this is just an interesting um, person that I really want you to kind of look up, right? So this is David Finkelhor. He works with um, perpetrators of sexual violence in America, right? So he works in prisons with people, with men who have been convicted of sexual violence. And he's very clear on that. And this really helps survivors. This really does help survivors. He's really clear that if someone has got the intention to do that, they will do that, okay? There's not anything you can do really to prevent something that's happening to you if someone has the intention of doing it. Yes, we can give out or, you know, this is the ways that we can kind of keep safe in certain situations. But given that most people are sexually assaulted by somebody they know and they're most likely sexually assaulted in their own home, there's not a lot you can do to prevent that. And he looks at all of this, that somebody who wants to do that, there's four preconditions. And the, the first one is, is that they just need to have overcome it themselves. They just they want to do it and they need to overcome that thing, that known right from wrong, because they do know right, it's a choice. Then the external inhibitors of, you know, how am I going to get away with this? Then they need to identify their victim and they need to make sure it's a victim that's that they can control. And then it's getting away with it. You know, it's, it's then um, doing that in order to got to have the motivation. They've got to get through all that internal, external um, noise that they're hearing. And they've got to identify a child that or a, or a person that is going to be 
susceptible to what they want to do. But look at look him up. It's, it's fascinating. He's got there's a report you'll find if you just put in his name, and it's really fascinating what he talks about. And when we talk to people and they survivors and they really struggle with but I must have done something that I must have said something or I should have done this or I should have done that but we talk to them about this and that all goes away because they realize there was nothing I could do it's just really really helpful and lastly just because we've been talking about some sensitive issues today if you have been affected by something that was spoken about or somebody you know might need some support there's two slides here there's one with a list of support pathways for female survivors of sexual violence and there's also a list of support pathways for male survivors of sexual violence. So you'll have all that now that it's recorded. Um, you're also welcome to have the slides. I'm not sure if that's the way you do it, but you can if you want. And just really, you know, really um, lots of different ways that people can get support. So I think I've kept to time a wee bit. I think I've got a bit over. I'm sorry, Leanne, I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> that's all right, Paula. No, 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 you're all right. You're fine. <laughs> That, that was really interesting. And to answer your question, yes, we can we can attach the slides to the YouTube description. So that's yeah, what yeah. you normally do if anybody wants to share. Um, I'll put it in the YouTube, YouTube description. Um, but also I can certainly um, send out the link to everybody that's tuned mm -hmm. in tonight um, mm -hmm. in a follow-up email and I'll get the link to that other video that you referenced as well. And then I can just send both of them out. Um, so... Before we go on to, we've got a couple of questions. So just to remind everyone, um, after everything you've heard, you can ask Paula any sort of questions by using the Q&A function in your toolbar. Um, if you just hover across your toolbar, you'll see Q&A. You can submit your questions that way. We've already got a couple, but actually I, I'm going to be quite cheeky and jump in with my own, first of all. Mm -hmm. and it's just as I was listening to you when you were going through it, I have heard of numerous stories of young people if they're kind of complaining about maybe receiving some negative behavior towards them from the opposite gender so for example if it's a young girl and a boy's being quite mean to um a teacher or a school staff member saying oh he's doing it because he fancies you and it's just to maybe ask you <laughs> you start doing that when you're going to schools and also do you maybe bring that up in conversation when the teachers are present? Because I think it's great that we're trying to empower our young people and give them the knowledge, but there's certainly some adults still out there that could be doing, I think, with some training. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. We, we, we're, we're, we're always really keen to do teacher training. It's not easy to, to, to get into <laughs> as you can imagine, because obviously when teachers do their in-service days and stuff, it's a very heavily scheduled thing. Um, I did do training recently at Strathclyde University with 35 student teachers. So they're about to graduate and go into their respective primary and secondary schools. And I think that's maybe the way to go to actually get them when they're in university before they go in. But yeah, I, I have heard some really questionable views from teachers, which I will challenge immediately. Especially if they say, I mean, I would challenge them anyway, but if they said them in front of the young people, I would never let that go. Um, but yeah, I, I I think it's important that, because this is, because I have, I've had the concern sometimes where I've been in a school, I've done a workshop, the young people have been great, they've been really receptive, they've been, you know, they get all going, they all start debating and stuff. And then the teacher, I know that that teacher is going to just ruin that when I go. <laughs> and not carry on that message. And in fact, I've had teachers who have actively tried to challenge me about facts and statistics whilst I've been doing a workshop. So yeah, I've had it before and I do try and challenge it there and then. Um, but I think there's definitely a need for teacher training around this subject specifically. Rachel's asking, all this is very important. It should be compulsory education along with domestic abuse. Has Scottish government considered this previously? And do you go into secondary schools only or both primary and secondary? So the Scottish government are looking at making it more, it's called equally safe in um, schools and higher and further education are just equally safe if you want to Google that. And that's where they're, they are saying that they, they, want to make, they, want, they want to be clear that behaviours around sexual violence will not be tolerated in any kind of educational institution. 
and there's various ways that you can you can challenge that so there actually is equally safe work going on in colleges and universities just now there is a schools approach as well and they're looking at different ways they can do that it's obviously quite a difficult one because because a lot of the time they're asking teachers to do it but they're asking teachers to do it when they've not been trained to do it and they're maybe comfortable doing it and they're not comfortable with the language and they have a really different relationship with the children than I would have when when I come in so they are they, they you know they're definitely so it's called equally safe and there is a skills approach to that where they're looking at doing a lot more education and building it into the curriculum and bringing in organizations like ours um, to challenge some of the attitudes um, so absolutely that the Scottish government are taking it very very seriously and there was a second part to that question. What was it? Yeah, so do you go into secondary schools only or do you work in primary schools as well? <laughs> Sorry, my memory was going there. Um, no, we do both. So we, we've the youngest I've ever worked with is primary six. Um, so we have to be careful because obviously we are talking about sex and consent or we're talking about relationship consent. I'm not talking about sex and consent with primary six-year-olds. We're talking about consent in general and we're talking about gender. So I did a really cool project one time with a group of primary schools in the South Side and it was an arts project. So I would go in and do a gender workshop with primary sixes and sevens about what what, what are you taught as a, as a boy or a girl? What do you believe as a boy or a girl at your age? You know, and what do you think about the opposite one? You know, what, what do you think about them? And and even down to, you know, the kind of jobs that boys and girls can do. And it, was, it's, it gets really funny because... We boys usually come out with girls can't do this and girls can't do that and the girls go mad. Yes, we can. So, um, so yeah, so we worked with it. And so I did a gender workshop with them and then they did an arts project, whether that was they painted something or they made a, they, they made up a song or they wrote a poem, it was something like that. But it, it was all about gender socialisation and consent in a non-sexual way because obviously we can't speak to primary sixes and sevens about sexual consent. So we do start from that age because we know that's where it comes from. We know it starts from that gender socialisation. Um, and I really enjoy working with the, the young, the younger ones, to be honest. I mean, and do you know what's really fascinating to me, especially for girls? I see, see when they're that age, primary six and seven, they're so confident and they're like, I can do anything and nobody's going to stop me from doing anything. And I wouldn't let anybody tell me what to do. And then really sadly, I'll see them again when they're in second year or third year and they're completely, they've lost their confidence, they've lost their self-esteem, they've got really problematic views about relationships and consent and what boys are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. And I just wonder what happens between primary seven and third year. What happens? What, what messages are they getting? You know, we know from music industry, computer games, from social media, from the dreaded Instagram, you know, we know they're getting really toxic messages about who they are what's expected of them what they should look like what boys are expecting of them and but it's just really sad for me to see that from that age I'm not a mum I'm like what age are you in primary seven from whatever age you are in primary seven to what age you are in third year you've got a completely different outlook on who you are and what your place is in society and I just find that fascinating yeah so a mum, I am a mum of a 14 year old, uh, mm -hmm. a young fourth year, so she's in fourth year. Um, and I would say a big part of that, particularly for my daughter, was um, just going through puberty and her body changing. Mm -hmm. just, like, she just feels like she has to hide herself. Mm -hmm. She feels like everybody notices these changes about her when mm -hmm. people don't as much. Yeah. Um, and I think that's got a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And then maybe a wee bit, like you were saying, a bit of confusion because then if you go into social media and and you're getting kind of uh, told what you should be wearing, that you should be <sighs> in your body, but it's not that easy. If yeah. your confidence isn't high as it is, mm -hmm. and, and you're already a bit like, oh, I've got these extra body parts that I didn't have yeah. before. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's a hard time. There's a lot going on yeah. with them, and, and yeah. you do see a big change in them. Uh -huh. um, the other question that Rachel has is, is there any primary aged or secondary age resources that you would recommend about consent? And actually see before you answer that, Paula, I will 
uh, tell the parents about the story I was just telling you before we come on here um, on a dog charity, um, which was quite random just this week on Facebook. There was a cartoon that they were sharing. And ultimately the message was about like not approaching strange dogs and just petting them. This is what the message was for this wee boy. But I actually thought it summed up consent really well for a young child to understand. Mm -hmm. And the cartoon was the man's walking along the road with his wee boy and the wee boy uh, stretches out to touch the dog. And the dad says, no, we have to ask the dog if we can pet him first. And he says, hi, Mr. Dog, can we pet you? And the wee boy's staring at him saying, it's just a dog though, why do we need to ask? And the dad said, well, we should always ask anyone or any animal if we can touch them before we do that. And I just thought that sums up consent really well for mm -hmm. a very young person to understand. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of start those messages really early. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I will get the more educated answer though. <laughs> no, I think, I, I think it's a great example for young people. There's also some amazing resources on the NSPCC website as well around talking to your children about consent. There's loads of great re resources on that. There's also SEOP, the Child Exploitation Online um, Centre. So Again, you know, there's great kind of resources on there. There's also, I did training recently. Again, I'll, try, I'll send you links to all these. I said I had a, it's called BISH, and it's a training tool for young people. And it's a guy called um, Justin Hancock, and he's developed all these amazing resources. Some you have to pay for, and might, maybe schools might want to invest in it. But there's other things on the website that are just really, really interesting about how you can talk to young people about consent. So there's lots of different things out there. Schools also have a zero tolerance pack that was um, developed in partnership with Rate Crisis. How often it's used, I don't know, but they certainly have a, 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 a pack that explores all the issues that we've spoken about tonight. So, but certainly NSPCC, CEOP, and as I say, I'll send a couple of other links that. Similar to that story that you're talking about, Leanne, there's a little video called Cup of Tea. I don't know if you've heard of that. Five minute video, and it's called Cup of Tea, and it's a YouTube video, and it's about, it's, it's explaining consent and how you would offer somebody a cup of tea that they want it or not. When you offered them the cup of tea and they said yes, but then you came back and they changed their mind, then they're not consenting anymore. So it's a way, it's a kind of easy way to talk about consent. And then also the trauma in the brain, the little like, kind of animation video. I think that's quite digestible as well. I don't think there's anything in it. Watch the parents watch it yourself first, but um, I don't think there's anything in it that's too problematic around language and things like that. But I can certainly send some links and I can speak to my colleagues tomorrow and find out if there's any other ones that they think would be really helpful. That would be good. And we can include all of these links that Paula sends me in the description of the YouTube video so that everything's all in the one place. Um, and I can certainly uh, testify to using the NSPCC um, resources. There's one called Pants or Underpants, and that's mm. about consent. And it's quite an easy way to explain to a really young child about like what's um, everything that's under their underwear, really. It is mm -hmm. really their name and nobody else the only thing I would say about it where it gets a wee bit confusing confusing maybe is when like my daughter started saying but what about when I'm at Grant's and Grant <laughs> puts me in the bath or um she did say like what about if I have to go to the doctors and I'm unwell but that was easy to explain because obviously the doctor yeah. wouldn't look at her if I wasn't there so mm -hmm. make sure you read over the resources before <laughs> and you get your mm -hmm. kind of story straight or you end up confusing yourself before you start talking to your young person about it um, so if there's no more questions for Rachel then we will hold on one one last one okay it's not Rachel it's Rachel asking you another question so <laughs> uh, do you think there is a societal reluctance to be more active about gender-based violence yeah I mean I think as a society in general we just don't want to talk about it and I understand that it's a difficult subject to talk about, but I work with a, a Swedish woman, Hannah, and she, she blows her mind how much we don't talk about sex relationships and consent and sexual violence here. 
she grew up in Sweden where she says from a very young age, <coughs> excuse me, my throat's getting dry, and from a very young age, they talk to them about their bodies and they talk to them about consent and obviously age appropriate, but but age appropriate to them is different because they do start talking about sex and relationships from quite a young age. She says, and the result of that is, is that we have very low numbers of sexual violence and especially child sexual abuse in Sweden because young people have the vocabulary, they understand what, what's happened to them isn't okay, um, and there's a, there are a, lot, a lot of better resources when it comes to criminal justice as well. So, but yeah, I think people don't want to think about it. They don't want to talk about it. And they think, you know, well, it's not happening to me. So I don't want to think about it. Or I would, or is that victim blaming? Well, that wouldn't happen to me because I wouldn't go out and get drunk and walk up the road myself. And if, if I was in a domestic abuse relationship and somebody hit me, I'd just walk away. Or if somebody tried to rape me, I'd fight them off. You know, it's all that, all that stuff about, I'm reluctant to talk about it and I'm reluctant to acknowledge it because then I have to acknowledge that I could be a victim of it or I could be a perpetrator of it. Mm-hmm. But I do think that society doesn't is, still doesn't want to talk about it. And that's and our, that's why they're so keen to blame the victims because it must have been something they done. That's much easier for them to, to accept. Yeah, agreed. And and by no means am I trying to say that I am the perfect parent. I definitely get it wrong plenty of times. But one thing I've certainly done with my daughter is I have always been very honest with her when it comes to the dangers in, in life and the the risks and, and the consequences. And if we ever see anything on the news, like I'll, I'll tell her what's happened. Obviously, mm-hmm. I can be appropriate level but I've always done that from a very young age so she's aware of what grooming is now Mm -hmm. and like how to look out for it Um, she's aware of like different things and actually there's been an incident recently that I can't get into too much detail because it's actually a criminal incident where I was so proud of how she handled it and I like to think it's because we have not shied away from these topics Mm -hmm. of conversation Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And when she was in a really quite dangerous situation, mm-hmm. she managed to get herself out of it really quickly when mm-hmm. a lot of other young people might have frozen in that mm-hmm. situation. Mm-hmm. And God knows what would have happened. So yeah. all, my advice as a parent to, to you guys as parents is please do have these difficult conversations with mm-hmm. your young people. It is mm-hmm. awkward. And don't get me wrong, there's been times where we've actually maybe had a conversation through a door with a bit of paper, especially mm-hmm. the underpants one. I remember she was at that age where she was like, no, I don't want to talk about this. And we, we actually had a conversation through a notepad about it because I just felt it was really important. So whatever makes you or your young person feel more comfortable to talk about it, find that way, mm-hmm. but don't avoid it. Definitely yeah. have those conversations. And what you will find is that your young person will be more inclined to come to you then and discuss anything that has happened to them or that they've witnessed or that they've heard about or anything, they'll be more open with you mm-hmm. to come and talk to you about those situations because they know mm-hmm. that you don't get easily embarrassed and it's not as awkward anymore. And I do, I think my, my daughter's quite open with me, mm-hmm. hopefully, about what goes on in her life. So mm-hmm. that's the best advice I can maybe give to use um, from one parent mm-hmm. to another. So at that point, um, we're going to wrap up because we have no more questions now. I want to say a massive thank you to Paula because that was a really difficult subject to talk about. And I think Paula explained it in a really clear, uh, clear and honest way. Um...